Welcome back for part two of our lecture on infectious diseases. In part one, we discussed bacteria and fungi, and in this video, we're gonna cover a variety of different viruses that can affect the oral cavity. We're gonna start with HPV. HPV stands for human papilloma virus, and it is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the US. There's actually over a hundred different variants of HPV, and about 35 of those have been identified in the oral cavity. These viruses can be either high risk or low risk, but of particular interest to us as oral professionals would be types 16 and 18 which are high risk variants that are known to cause squamous cell carcinoma in the oral cavity. Most people associate HPV with cervical cancer, but HPV is thought to cause 70% of oropharyngeal cancers in the US according to the Centers for Disease Control. So needless to say, this is a virus that we need to know about. We need to ask about it. And we need to be proactive in educating our patients about HPV. There are three benign lesions caused by HPV that we want to cover. I've already mentioned that some variants of HPV are low risk types and some are high risk. So let's talk about some of those benign lesions that can result from HPV in the oral cavity. The text is going to tell you which low risk types are associated with these benign conditions, but I don't really want you to focus on memorizing that. What I need you to remember is that HPV 16 and 18 are the high risk squamous cell associated type for us. The first benign condition that we want to identify is called Veruca vulgaris, which is also known as a common wart. Usually these are found on the skin, but they can be found intraorally most of the time on the lips. These are going to appear as papillary white lesions that have finger-like projections microscopically. Now this lesion here is quite large, so we're able to distinguish those finger-like projections visually. If you see a question about white finger-like projections, you should put Veruca vulgaris on your short list. The treatment for this would just simply be excision. However, these do tend to recur. The second benign lesion that we want to cover is a condyloma acuminatum. These lesions are distinguished from Veruca vulgaris because they're more pink in color and more diffuse, but they also do have finger-like projections microscopically and sometimes visually, so make sure that you're looking at the color of the lesion. These are usually found in the genital region, but they can be transmitted to the oral cavity through oral sex or self-inoculation. With a uh, condyloma acuminatum, you would see multiple lesions throughout the oral cavity. Remember that Veruca vulgaris is white and condyloma acuminatum is pink. The treatment for this is the same. We would surgically excise the lesion, but again, they do tend to recur. And the last of the three benign lesions that we want to learn is multifocal epithelial hyperplasia. This is also referred to as Heck disease and is usually found in children. We would see multiple pale pink nodules throughout the oral mucosa, which we could distinguish from just a fibroma because a fibroma tends to happen due to irritation, right? So if we're seeing multiple pale pink nodules throughout the oral mucosa, then we would suspect that something else is going on. Now, unlike Veruca vulgaris and condyloma acuminatum, these do not contain finger-like projections. They also tend to spontaneously resolve within a few weeks or months after onset, so they do not require any treatment. Let's move on to herpes simplex virus. There are two types of herpes simplex vi virus that we're gonna talk about, uh, HSV1 and HSV2. HSV1 is very, very common. It is usually acquired during childhood. Children get inoculated with this virus from their parents or their siblings. And we see this virus affect usually the lips and the mouth. It can affect the genital area, but usually we're gonna see this affect um, the, the face. HSV2, however, is um, contracted through sexual contact. The oral lesions are more rare, but we can have HSV2 orally. 
we're we're not going to see with HSV two um, because it's genital. The the lesions are not as locally symptomatic as those that are on the lips. So we're going to talk about the symptoms of labial herpes in just a minute. But just know that there is a difference in how these two are contracted, and HSV one is the one that we're going to see uh, very frequently in practice. So let's go on and talk about that. This one has the herpes recurrent herpes labialis. It has a characteristic appearance of a cluster of vesicles which are formed into one lesion. And you're gonna see this typically on the lower vermilion border of the lip. When a patient contracts herpes simplex virus, it's gonna enter into a latent state of sort of living or hanging out in that nerve tissue of the trigeminal ganglion. And then when it is triggered, the lesion will reappear and break out. So they're often called cold sores or fever blisters because they tend to break out during times of illness. But there are other things that can stimulate the virus to repli replicate and cause a lesion, like sunlight. For women, just menstruation can cause it. For some people, fatigue, emotional stress. So we tend to see many HSV-1 lesions appear in our students every semester, probably as a result of stress. Uh, these are going to start with the prodromal period where the patient's going to experience pain and burning or tingling in the area where the vesicles develop. The amount of virus present is going to be at its highest during the vesicular stage. And the patient will often have an oozing at that site, which is highly contagious. So imagine the viral load present in that wet vesicle, and then imagine taking an ultrasonic and aerosolizing that virus. What's gonna happen? Well, for us as a provider, hopefully you'd be wearing appropriate PPE, but for the patient, this could spread the virus to the patient's eyes or other areas. So for the sake of the patient, the best practice is to reschedule the patient until such a time that that outbreak has crusted over and is no longer oozing or wet. So in our clinic, if a patient presents with an active herpetic lesion, the patient should be dismissed and rescheduled. Now, most of these lesions are gonna resolve on their own within one to two weeks. There has been some advance in antiviral medications which can reduce the healing time in some patients, but most of these patients are used to having these outbreaks and they just treat themselves symptomatically until they recover. I want to talk a little bit about this condition, herpetic whitlow, because it's something we don't see very often anymore because of proper infection control. But this used to be a significant issue before the routine use of gloves. Recently, however, we're seeing a comeback of this infection from a very interesting source, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Herpetic whitlow is very painful. It's an infection of the finger which occurs when the herpes virus is transmitted through a break in the skin around the end of the finger. So why are we seeing a comeback? Well, have any of you ever taken part in the new fad of nail dipping? Have you ever considered how many fingers have been in that dip powder? Now, nail salons are not supposed to reuse that powder over and over. They're supposed to portion out the powder in a separate container for each client, but that leads to waste of the powder, and in order to reduce waste, they cut corners and have the client dip their finger in the powder from the original jar. If you've ever had your nails done, you know that breaks in the skin near the cuticle are pretty much expected. So we're just cross-contaminating that dipping powder with every client. So what do you do? How can you avoid herpetic whitlow at the nail salon? Well, first, ensure that they're properly sterilizing their tools between clients, which doesn't occur very often in my experience and consider buying your own dip powder and bringing it with you to the salon or forego the dip powder altogether. Herpes zoster is also called shingles and it is caused by the varicella zoster virus which is the same virus that causes the chicken pox. Now, most of you listening to my lecture have probably never had the chicken pox because of modern vaccination. However, this vaccination was not available when I was a kid, and I remember vividly having a terrible case of the chicken pox when I was in the fourth grade. In fact, the entire school erupted with chicken pox after my cousin contracted the virus during a vacation at Disney World right before school started. 
Because the inoculation period is two weeks, she had already been in class several days before her lesions appeared. So over the next few months, the virus like completely ravaged our school. This same virus becomes latent inside of its victims. So I will always have the varicella zoster virus inside of me. Um, just like herpes simplex. And when it encounters a stimulus, it can erupt in a very painful condition called shingles. Shingles will erupt usually unilaterally along a distribution of one of the sensory nerves. So since all three branches of the trigeminal nerve can be affected, the patient can experience facial or intraoral shingles. An outbreak of shingles can last for months and cause debilitating pain. Treatment usually is designed to relieve symptoms by the use of antivirals and pain medication. If you've ever known anybody who's had the shingles, you know that this is not a fun outbreak. It is extremely painful. It can truly debilitate the person depending on the severity of that outbreak. The Epstein-Barr virus is also known as the kissing disease because it's most often transmitted through saliva, but it can be transmitted through other various methods, including sexually or via blood transfusion, or even during birth or breastfeeding, um, even organ transplantation. This virus is associated with four conditions in the oral region. Infectious mononucleosis, which is the most commonly known, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, Burkitt lymphoma, and hairy leukoplakia. We're going to talk about hairy leukoplakia in just a little bit when we cover HIV and AIDS. But what I want to really focus on here is infectious mononucleosis because this one is the most common disease caused by Epstein-Barr. These patients will have a sore throat, a fever, lymphadenopathy. They're probably going to complain of fatigue. The patient may also have palatal petechia in the early infectious process of mono. And some patients um, throughout the, the course of their disease may develop some severe complications, um, hepatic complications in particular. Uh, they may even have a swollen spleen. Th this one can really cause some havoc on the body. It's often transmitted by kissing someone who's infected with the disease, but it will usually resolve in four to six weeks. So treatment is really aimed at symptom management, but it is highly contagious. So these patients typically are kept away from other people for an extended period of time. Coxsackie virus is transmitted through fecal oral contamination or saliva or respiratory droplets. So this one is the cause of herpangina, hand, foot, mouth, and acute lymphonodular pharyngitis. The most common of these three is going to be hand, foot, mouth disease, which occurs in epidemics in kids under five. Both of my kids have had hand, foot, mouth. Most of my friend's kids have had this one. So while the appearance of this one is pretty off-putting, it can, it can really cause panic in a parent the first time you see it, the lesions usually resolve in two weeks. This is the one I really want you to remember, just simply because your kids are likely to have this one at some point. And once you see it, you'll recognize it by its characteristics characteristic outbreak on the hands and the feet and the mouth. So when those lesions are limited to those three regions, we can narrow that down pretty easily. Thankfully, we don't have to cover much about mumps and measles at this point because we rarely see them. Unfortunately, however, because of the anti-vax movement, I won't go on my uh, vaccination ranting in this video, but we are seeing a comeback of these diseases. They are both caused by the virus paramyxovirus and are highly contagious. They can be spread very easily through saliva, through sharing a utensil, having close contact with an infected individual. Mumps is a viral infection of the salivary glands, particularly the parotid glands, and measles will cause more symptomatic, um, uh, systemic symptoms. So here is going to be your second submission question. What is the name of the vaccine that prevents mumps and measles? Okay, moving on 
on to HIV uh, and AIDS. HIV is the acronym for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. This virus was first identified in 1983 and then designated as HIV in 1986. HIV is primarily transmitted by sexual contact with an infected person or by blood or blood products and mothers can transmit this virus to um, their babies. HIV affects the immune system, in particular, this virus is going to attack the CD4 T helper lymphocyte. This lymphocyte is very important in both cell mediated immunity and regulating the immune response. So the virus can affect a number of other cells as well, but the CD4 T helper is the one you mostly need to remember. So why? Well, as this disease progresses, the CD4 lymphocytes decrease and the patients become more vulnerable to opportunistic infections and even cancers. So CD4 count is typically between 550 to 1000 lymphocytes per microliter of blood. And when that number drops to less than 2000, then the patient's disease has progressed into AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Some of the oral manifestations of HIV or AIDS, we would see oral candidiasis. Now, before I go through this list, uh, remember we've already learned about most of these. So this is just a review, just that these are opportunistic infections and these patients have a very, very weakened immune system. So they're at high risk. So we have oral candidiasis, herpes simplex, herpes zoster, Hairy leukoplakia, I mentioned very briefly when we were talking about Epstein Barr. Um, the hairy leukoplakia that is associated with HIV AIDS is going to be a white hairy leukoplakia on the lateral borders of the tongue. So, as opposed to most leukoplakia, which happens on the dorsal surface um, as a result of insufficient shedding, um, this one is going to occur on the lateral borders. It's very distinct. I've never actually seen this uh, myself. So if you did see it, it would be pretty characteristic and something that we would want to refer. Um, we can also see an increased risk of HPV, Kaposi sarcoma, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, lymphoma, gingival and periodontal disease, and even aphthous ulcers. The bottom line is, guys, when a patient's immune system is compromised, particularly with um, such a devastating disease such as HIV, then they're going to be vulnerable to every opportunistic infection that we've talked about in this course. However, we have made so many advances in HIV, and the, the goal with HIV is to maintain that um, CD4 T helper cell count. So they have lots of medications that can even get that count to a normal range and keep that patient at a normal range for an extended period of time. So it's not nearly as scary as it was even 10, 15 years ago, but it's still something that we need to talk about and be aware of. So I told you we were going to talk about Kaposi sarcoma, and this is going to be a board alert. Why? Because Kaposi sarcoma is an opportunistic neoplasm, so a cancer, that occurs in patients specifically with HIV AIDS. So this lesion will appear as a reddish purple flat or raised lesion anywhere in the oral cavity. This is going to be a characteristic neoplasm, which if identified would fulfill the criteria for the diagnosis of AIDS. So it's a board alert because if they ask you about Kaposi sarcoma, you need to associate that with the diagnosis of AIDS. Okay, this is going to be a pretty short video. That is the end of part two um, <clears throat> on viruses uh, as part of our infectious disease lecture in chapter four. If you have any questions, as always, email me. And, you know, I can't end the video without saying please like my video or make a comment. 